up in New Boston. Uh, I hope you all <coughs> enjoy it. I believe you all will really enjoy it. Uh, and uh, if any folks have interest in genealogy, we would certainly appreciate you joining our society. Uh, we're not going to have any kind of a regular business meeting tonight, so we will just cut right to the chase. But as we usually do, we open our meetings with a small prayer, so we will have that. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering this evening. Bless all these people that are here to give the program. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our great country, our great state, and our great communities. Protect those who protect us in our country. These things we ask in thy name, amen. amen. So.
and uh, I was born to Lowell, and so my Renner McGee, their occupation was poultry farm and baby chick hatchery. My dad Renner could tell a rooster from a pullet when that baby chick was one day old. He had to go to school to learn it, but we decided it'd be better and cheaper if he learned how to do it instead of hiring the Japanese sexers or the uh, ones that were just hired, but the, we were paying too much. So Dad Renner said, I can do that. And he learned that. Uh, I had a brother who was like a twin. He was three and a half years old. And uh, his name was Ron Renner. He went to Texas A&M. He became a missionary on the island. Came back home and got his burying and burying degrees degree. He already had one in poultry from a and and he took back with him a lady named Elaine Renner, and they were there 25 years. So, uh, it became a breeder at Walmart for another almost 25 years. So, uh, I went, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the early childhood when I grew up, I was um, always getting into stuff. I loved playing around the house and all, but I fell into a tub of water when my mother was washing. And I uh, almost drank. The tub of water was under an old tiny washing machine. And uh, it was being, uh, the water was being let out into a sink tub or The highway wasn't there then. We had an old highway, and, and then there was river before. 
boards in the string of houses on the end. That's where we lived, down by the woods. So it's kind of uh, in a world of my own there. I had one of the Danes and the Bodeckers and Mr. Stone and uh, Mr. Sid Gung and uh, the Stewarts and Melvins. There's Melvins here. Now we grew up together. Uh, we can't remember when we didn't know each other. And we, uh, we had a lot of fun. Got into, got into mischief a few times, but our dad's always straightened that out. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And what I like to say about growing up in New Boston, it was like growing up in, in a normal rock of pain. It was just, it was just home. It was just, we had so much fun. We played baseball. Uh, there, was a, there was a baseball game going on somewhere all the time in the summertime, and we played out in the pastures. Uh, and sometimes we'd play on the, the baseball field, which the field back then was on Merrill Street, uh, the, the home plate thing, the, you know, the home plate was next to Merrill Street, across from where it is now. And, uh, but, uh, the, there was just always some kind of activity. We played all outside all the time because we didn't have AC back then. We didn't have heat in the winter. Uh, winter time, mother pulled out the feather beds, and uh, you know, we'd stand by an old Dearborn stove. And you warm up and then run down those wood floors and jump in bed and pile all that, uh, all the quilts. And you know how well, you, know, you just sunk in that feather mattress and you were there for the night. Didn't move, but uh, uh, my—I uh, guess I talked to my the roots of my family. <clears throat> uh, back into Red River County. My family came into Red River County in the 1830s when it was a republic, and uh, and my mother and dad both were born and grew up. In Red River County, and like I said, Dad, the old home by the place burned in 1944. Mother and Dad come in the Avery when I came home, the house was ablaze. And Dad had worked at the Arsenal for about two years at that time, and some military officer told him about East Hook's corpse. So I would guess early 1945, they moved into East Hook's corpse. It's the first time in their lives that they have had indoor plumbing. And electricity. And like I said, I was born when, when we lived in books. And uh, I was about 15 months old when, when we moved to uh, New Boston. And it was just so fun growing up here in this town. I just loved it. And it's still home. I mean, I live in Grand Prairie, Texas. It's home. But this is still home, and I always would. You're going to ask us questions later on, right? Pardon? You're going to ask us questions later on. What? I'm just going to remind you of the topics. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to introduce myself because uh, that's what I came prepared to do, and that's the easiest thing for me to talk about. My name is Tim Graham, and I'm the oldest son of James Theodore, Jimmy, and Beverly Graham, and the first grandchild of the late Theo and Bessie Kessler Graham. Uh, I was born in 1967 on Tuesday, August the 8th, and my dad gave all of his employees off that day, the day that I was born. Uh, that's according to Tommy Brown, Jr., uh, Tommy and Doris Brown's oldest son. Uh, I have two brothers, Todd, who lives in Rockwall, Texas, with his wife, Shanna, and their two children, Travis and uh, Shelby. And then I've got another uh, brother named Terry who lives here, and uh, he lives on the old farm with his wife, Amanda, and uh, they have two kids, uh, Jackson and Ella. Uh, I graduated from New Boston High School in 1985, uh, followed in my dad's footsteps and Ron Renner's footsteps and went down to Texas A&M and graduated in 1989. And, <laughs> and spent four years in Houston before I came back to New Boston on the 1st of April, 1993, at the request of my dad. I'm married to the former Christina Marie Drennan. She's back there in the back with the pink sweater on. She's a 1990 graduate from New Boston, and she graduated from <clears throat> Texas in uh, 1995. Uh, she's the daughter of James and Franca Drennan. James is from Hooks, and Franca taught Spanish here for many years at the high school. And uh, we have two boys, Tyler and Trent. Uh, Tyler graduated from New Boston High School in 2017, 
and Trent graduated in 2020. And then Tyler turned around and graduated from A&M in 2021. And he now lives off Lake Tawakany and works for a little company called Encore out of Dallas. And Trent is a junior at Texas A&M, majoring in architectural engineering. Uh, as most high school classes do, uh, we've got, we had a yell uh, when we were seniors. And uh, ours was, we're the greatest class alive, senior class of 85. And uh, I believe in that with all my heart. Uh, you know, and I'll tell you why. Because we had a bunch of classmates that pushed one another back then hard. Uh, we pushed one another scholastically, uh, physically, mentally, career-wise. We still celebrate one another's successes. Uh, we encourage one another. We pick one another up after a fall. And we hold one another accountable. But, uh, and although there are many men and women with whom I share these memories, there's one special group uh, that I hold in high esteem. Uh, after 35 plus years after graduation, Dr. Jeff Atkinson, who's in the audience tonight, he's a dentist here in town, uh, Todd Davis, Daryl Grubbs, Craig Norman, and myself will get together at least one weekend during the summer and travel somewhere in Texas or Arkansas to spend three or four days in the company of one another. Uh, Daryl's our proverbial tour guide. He's the one that plans everything. Uh, we've gone canoeing, whitewater rafting, golfing, tubing, water skiing to the movies, uh, baseball games, basketball games, concerts, and so many restaurants. And uh, from time to time, we'll stop in to see old classmates. Uh, Kim Phillips, who was a uh, star football player here in New Boston, and he was on the state championship basketball team in 1984 and played, uh, played football for the North Texas uh, Mean Green and then went on to play for the Saints uh, for a while. But we stopped in to watch him coach his boys in basketball. And from time to time, we'll go down to see uh, Denise Douglas, uh, Martha and UB Douglas's daughter, and her husband, Kyle Kuno, and uh, we'll spend the weekend at their house in Horseshoe Bay. Uh, we've had much more fun than we should have, and, and uh, we retell the stories of high school hundreds of times. Uh, you know, we laugh at our former escapades. We thank God that the technology that's available today was not available <laughs> back then. Uh, we catch up on one another's lives, and we kind of bear our souls knowing that everything, well, well, most everything will be held in confidence only to be brought up on these trips, but more importantly, we celebrate the, the friendship, the good fortune of our friendship. A small town like New Boston has the ability to shape future leaders, to make men and women better suited for marriage, better suited for raising kids, and uh, the ability to live a life in the company of friends. Uh, it has afforded that to many generations of the Graham family, and I hope that we can continue that legacy for many generations to come. I've used my five minutes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that nod to the to the fight in Texas Aggies. <laughs> Day 
and I would walk across that wet ground before school and I'd have my clothes and shoes and socks wet every time. <laughs> and I'd come back with an empty uh, pork with a dime in it. All the way home, I'd grab that dime until I got home. So we can understand back in those days, milk was a dime for a pork. I can also uh, tell you that I had a neighbor down the street named uh, Jean Mara. She was just, a, I think, a year older than me. And one day we thought, let's go riding our bikes, and uh, oh, a good place would be, let's ride over to James Bowie, because Dad Brenner, my dad, was helping uh, lay brick for, uh, for their new uh, cafeteria. And she, he would ride with Chuck Wilbur sometimes, and Chuck Wilbur would ride with him. Well, it was Dad's turn to take the truck. So he took the truck to Chuck's house. G. Moore and I rode our, well, we made a picnic. Mom said, yeah. And back then, we could go that far and not be afraid of anybody. And I don't think we saw for three cars on that highway the whole time we traveled. We, we rode our bikes clear to James Boy School, got there, and Dad Brennan said, well, what are you doing? And we told him, we'll put our bikes in the back of your truck and ride back with you. He said, well, honey, you better start back as soon as you eat your picnic lunch because I rode with Chuck today. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a little coup. <laughs> so we went, I think that was probably 20, maybe 22 miles. She today still blames me for her poor complexion. <laughs> but now she does live in Arizona, so I can't take all of <laughs> I had a friend named Mary Catherine, too, down at the courthouse. We had more fun playing on that courthouse lawn. And they let us. We skated on the sidewalk. We would uh, go in and listen to the court uh, procedures and this uh, oval would sometimes say, no, not this one today, y'all, get out. Uh, we played Blue Jay, which is a short form of, well, if you have less players. It's a baseball game with less players. We play Blue Jay. One time I spent the night with my friend uh, Mary Catherine, who was a granddaughter of the jailer. And that back then they had a building built onto the jail. Am I through? Oh, good. Anyway, <laughs> the jailer's wife was also the janitor. And she, we were walking around uh, looking at the jail. She said, now I know I cleaned that jail cell. What's that under that cot? Well, Mary Cat and I go in to look under the cot. We hear this door slam behind us. And the key go, well, <laughs> and sis, Rainey was her name, sis walks off, leaves us. Finally, she comes back just laughing. She says, you can never say you could not be locked up in the Bowie County Jail. Like I said, I grew up on the East Hoskins Street, and as far as shopping and stores and everything, my mother and dad were coming from old farming families in Red River County. My dad was the fourth of ten children. My mom was the oldest of ten children. So we uh, grew almost everything that we ate. We had a lot of garden space. Uh, we, uh, we went to the barn to get our milk, and we churned butter. We kill the beef every year, so that's then, then as far as our shopping goes, uh, uh, we uh, used to shop at D.H. Cox Grocery who, when I was in high school, and uh, that's how I worked for Mr. Cox, and still is one of my role models, one of the finest persons I've ever known in my life. And he taught me many things by his uh, actions that I really didn't realize till later in life. And the main thing was treating everybody, everyone, with respect. 
when uh, I had this little red wagon, and Kay Jean, my sister that's here tonight, she and I used to go up in the Red River Court. We'd have vegetables, and we used to go up in the Red River Court from door to door selling vegetables. I don't remember how much we got, that's, but, uh, and we actually went to, you all remember the store south of Red River Courts? The building is still there. It's called Bruce's Store. And we used to go into Bruce's and we'd sell him produce or hey, We had chickens way back then. And then I was still pretty little when we got rid of the chickens. And that's when we started going out to, to uh, Renner's. And, and it was a long trip, not, not to get to Ed, because my dad and Mrs. Renner would talk and talk and talk and talk. But they both them, you know, love people and they love to talk. But, it was always a joy, and that was neat to me to go out to the to the river uh, farm. <clears throat> um, what were other topics? People in your neighborhood. Okay, my neighborhood. Uh, I can start on the end, on the very end of the street down. Uh, there's a power substation there now. My house is not there anymore, but this church up there. Melvin, Linda, Don, and then later on Annette. And uh, the Stewarts and Mrs. Stewart, they were kind of like my second family because if I wasn't at their house, they were at my house. Next to them was the priests, but I did not remember the priest, and they moved before I remember it. And Sid and Vady Dunn moved in next door to us. Uh, um, um, Mrs. Lady Young was a school teacher. She taught at the old highway school, which that building has not been here for a long time. It's not too far from Skaggs, uh, James Skaggs School. It's not too far from there. Uh, then, then was our house, the cemetery road, and then the Stinsons, and later on, Homer and Francis Jones lived in the next house. And then the house after that, uh, the Deans, moved in Roy Dean and Mrs. Dean, who her husband, I believe was died from a car accident, and he was a boat decker. And that was, was Delbert and Doris boat decker, and, and that was still around. And he's one told me one time that said, you know, we, where we grew up was kind of like a world of our own, because we were, felt like we were just far separated from New Boston. But uh, anyway, it was, it was a neat, fun neighborhood. And then later on, Mr. and Miss Dean had a daughter named Janet Lee, because uh, they'd be going somewhere, and I would go down, and they wanted me to babysit Janet Lee, and she was in a little baby bed, and I'm not sure why they needed me, but I, she would throw her toys out, and I'd put them back in. She would throw them out, and I'd put them back in. That's, that's pretty much the whole deal for that. Uh, after that, after that was Cater, Cater and Marco Jones, and Cater was a brother to Homer Jones, and after that, the Hammonds. Mr. and Ms. Hammonds, and Mr. Hammonds was in the uh, dirt moving business and a hard, hard worker. And, and, and you would hear him down there at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning with his bulldozer going, scraping up a, a dirt, loading his dump trucks, getting ready for the next day. And the home the Hammonds, uh, Billy Back, Marilyn, Nancy, Nancy, who lives in uh, Mount Pleasant, and then Annette. And, uh, and there was also a cheerleader role. Uh, well, I didn't mention the, 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 the Stones. After the Bodeckers moved out, or Mr. and Miss Dean, the Stones moved in. Mr. Stone, who was one of the top New Boston sports fans of all time. And he and I were, he was another one of my role models, and still is. He and I went berry picking. I can't tell you how many times we'd go coon hunting. And, this man grew up up in the country in Arkansas, and you talk about a man that could walk. He could walk. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, the next topic is. Oh, sorry, Jim. All right. You may not want to hear this story. Uh, on September the 5th, 1972, we moved into our house at 210 South Park Drive, where we, my mom and dad still live today. Um, but there was something, but there wasn't a whole lot of people that lived in that neighborhood at that time. But as time wore on, man, it was just chock full of kids. Uh, Marshall Deer and Peggy moved in across the street. Angela Deer, Holly Deer, John Deer, Dee Deer. And then right next to us was Lynn Davis, Kyle Davis, and Jill Davis. And you went down a little bit further, and there was Jeff Messer and Carrie Messer. And then we had a famous politician 
that lived at the end of our street by the name of Ham Atkinson. And he lived down there with his wife, Pat, and their three children, Lori, Melinda, and Amy. And uh, as you came across the street from there, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Surratt that had a daughter, Marla Surratt, that was a little bit older than we were, and Lee Surratt was a year younger. And as you made your way down the street, there were so many people, so many young kids uh, our age that were growing up. Uh, I remember Terry Dameron, who was a coach here for, or uh, his dad was a coach here for a while. Uh, we hung out a little bit together. But uh, David Ruff built seven or eight houses in that neighborhood and continually moved his family around from one to the next. And there was uh, Connie, Lisa, uh, Carla, and little David. And, uh, you know, we kind of had neighbors as they uh, went about there. And then as you get down to the big barn house, which is another one that uh, David Ruff built, uh, Amy Ferris and Paul Ferris lived there. And uh, Paul was a year older, and Amy was two years younger than I was. But the one thing I remember about Paul Ferris's house, that is where I took my first dip of skull. <laughs> and I sat down at that table, and it didn't really taste very good. It was kind of grainy, but I went to stand up. <laughs> and I got so dizzy, I fell down. That was it for me and the scold and the Copenhagen and none of that. Now, I would never try that again. And then we came around the corner and there was uh, uh, Todd Lambert, April Lambert, lived down at the end of our street with uh, Tommy and Teresa Prane's sons, Paul. And as you came up the street, uh, Deborah Cloud and her brother Danny uh, lived on the corner, Michelle Tibble, uh, Angela Tibble, Galen Tibble. Uh, they lived there, and also Scott and Sandy Overstreet. Uh, Sean and Shanna Curtis lived in the cul-de-sac. Uh, we just had so many kids that lived in the neighborhood, and then there was a special woman that moved in. She was a little bit behind us that had three absolutely beautiful, gorgeous daughters, Alice Ann, Lisa, and Leslie Lee. And uh, they moved in. They were a little bit behind us, uh, but anyway, we got to hang out with them on a regular basis. How many more minutes do I have left, Pat? I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, my dad was fortunate enough to have Graham's appliance growing up. And when I was 10 years old, I started working for him, uh, toting small tools and doing things like that. So uh, I was fortunate to be able to go to work with my dad during the summer. And we had a lot of things that we would do during the summer, going around to visit businesses, repair air conditioners. Because in the heat of the Texas summer, people are impatient about their air conditioners not working. So we, uh, we got to see a lot of people, meet a lot of business owners. Uh, one favorite memory of mine is big old Jim Duffer strolled through that alley about 6.30, 6.45 in the morning, big old cigar in his mouth. And he and my dad would talk business, you know, about what jobs that Jimmy Graham needed to do to get Jimmy Duffer's house ready to sell. Um, Bill Stevens was right next door on Western Auto. So we had a lot of uh, good thing, good memories with him growing up. And we used to eat at Randy Wortham's uh, meat shop right across the way. My granddad liked his sausage and his cheese. So we'd go there and eat pretty regular. But my favorite memory is going and checking out at Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> Hiram Sheep could operate that cash register like no man I've ever seen in my life. And uh, we would also shop at Cox Grocery. We shopped at Parker Grocery. Uh, to get our groceries and uh, one time my mom made the mistake of taking us to Glenda's florist and left Todd and I in the car together and uh, we were kind of around bunches and rowdy and I popped that old cigarette lighter into the deal and uh, tried to burn him out of the car. <laughs> That's the one thing that I got a spanking for when I got home that I wasn't supposed to burn my brother with that cigarette lighter thing. <laughs> but to me growing up Saturdays was special. Uh, we worked you know, Monday through Friday, 8 to 7 to 5. But on Saturday, my, my dad would take me to the Chuck Wagon restaurant. And I don't remember how big that table was, but to a 10-year-old, it looked like it was 30 foot across. And there were a bunch of giants that sat at that table. And my, my favorite memory about that is I got to order that pecan cinnamon roll with butter on it, and Miss Alice would bring that thing out to me. And I sure miss that, uh, miss those memories too. All right. Sorry about that, Pat. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were only here. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know when to stop. <laughs> Next topic is church, school, band, sports, and what you did for fun. Entertain. Okay, um, I was 
I uh, guess I've gone to the Temp Church, Methodist Church all my life, and they had a revival, and that was the greatest thing they ever did as far as my brother and I were concerned because in 1944 we gave our hearts to the Lord, and it was uh, the Tent Revival was just where the library is now, and there's the concrete that was all grass, and I don't think Cape Pals was there. I know it was June 1944, so I'm not certain. All I know is there was a tent, and Brother G.P. Comer was the pastor, and uh, that was one of the greatest things that happened as far as church is concerned. Uh, as far as the band, I loved the New Boston High School Band, and I was so fortunate to have Mr. Jansen, Mr. Eldon Jansen, the last two years, and I think that might have been maybe his uh, first or second year to ever teach a band, but you all who know a lot about bands and music, he was well known. He just passed away this, I think this year, and uh, my grandson wants to be a band director, and they even know of Mr. Eldon Jensen. He was a terrific man. And uh, I was uh, a majorette in high school, but uh, I played the clarinet, and I, in the second grade, I had gotten this front incisor knocked out jumping a rope by two guys throwing hot pepper up a long rope. You know, one guy here, one guy there, they finally start doing hot pepper, faster and faster. And I was just in, in the second, I fell, and when I fell, I hit my mother's car fender because we were at Bill Burgles getting gas and on that front porch is where we were waiting for the school bus and, and jump rope. And the poor customers had to go around us. I don't know how Bill put up with us. But that's what happened back in second. And uh, as far as I can remember also, I didn't play sports because I was in the band and you couldn't do sports in band, I don't guess, and have a study hall. But I loved to ride horses. I had four horses over my lifetime. And uh, I had a friend who rode horses also, and at one time, I'm not sure how Marilyn Cox whether she was the rodeo queen or she was the first place winner of barrel racing. But I do know someone had asked me if I'd please. First uh, place winner. Okay. If I would present the trophy to her, but wear your gown and nice high heels. And I said, in a rodeo <laughs> arena? And they said, yes, but we will put a piece of plyboard down. So there I was. <coughs> getting out there and finally getting on the flyboard. And it was the sweetest picture though, and they're going to have that picture in the new steakhouse. The new steakhouse. <laughs> it's oh. Marilyn and her daddy on their horses, and I was handing her a trophy. And I, I thought that was a sweet thing to, to remember. Uh, also, about talking about riding horses, I was on a horse in the arena one time. We, we just enjoyed playing in that arena. They, they allowed us to. How many of you remember having the Bowie County Fair at New Boston? Yeah. Okay, it closed down after Texas County started the larger uh, okay, fair. But uh, back there on that round table, you're going to find the brochure of the Bowie County Fair back in, I think it was 1929, I think it's 29, isn't that something? And uh, the, the building that's down there now, the large building that they use for uh, high school, uh, some sort of, what kind of? Okay, that used to be the National Guard Armory before that, it was Bowie County Fair Exhibition only. That's what it was for use for, for exhibiting your uh, beautiful farm products or maybe your arts and crafts or whatever on the 
other end of the soccer field was the rodeo arena, and that's where I, okay, time. That's where my horse rolled over with me. I remember the fair real well. Uh, I uh, grew up, uh, well, I attended the uh, New Boston Church of Christ. Uh, I went all 12 years to New Boston, to the New, New Boston IFSD. Uh, my first three years, I went to number two, which at the, was at the north end of Red River Courts, where Tim's grandmother was the principal. And she had an electric paddle. <laughs> I don't know anyone that ever saw it, but we knew she had one, and it was a, it, and it was a remedy for behavior, and it worked. <laughs> uh, of course, from there I went to uh, back over to the old junior high, which is uh, well where the high school is now, with the old junior high that I went to, and then of course you cross the street, go to the high school. Uh, or, uh, well, our, our principal at the, uh, the well, I guess you call the middle school, and that was fourth grade through eighth grade, was Mr. R.B. Turner. And uh, his mom was uh, was a fifth grade teacher, and then we went to high school. I mean, did I say his mom? His wife, I'm sorry. And then Mrs. Orella Turner was a fifth grade teacher, and, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, we crossed the street and uh, went to the New Boston High School where Mr. Hubert Simpson's reputation preceded us going across the street. So anyway, I was very shy and very quiet, believe it or not. And it's good because I go to class, because I, was, uh, uh, I go to class with you just now and, and nobody can relate. I never sets up, you know. But, and I was very small in the ninth grade. I weighed 98 pounds, so I didn't play any sports. I was not that active in anything in high school. I just had my buddies there, uh, JT Moppet there. We've been JT and I met each other in the fourth grade, uh, and we've been best friends since. Kept in close touch. As a matter of fact. Uh, JT went into the army when I was in Vietnam, and then he wound up in Korea. And uh, I was in Vietnam while JT was in Korea, and we were corresponding with letters from each other. But we've kept in touch through all the years, and uh, what our families. And, that, and that one thing I didn't mention to just very quickly, uh, I was married to the uh, uh, former Rosemary Pencil from uh, Duncanville, Texas. My dear wife of 49 years passed away. 16 months ago, I have two children, James Titus, who is a corporate jet pilot, and my daughter Rebecca, and her husband live in Colorado. She works for USAA, been with them for 15 years. Uh, I have two grandchildren, uh, one's a sophomore in high Well, then this next fall, I'll have two grandchildren in high school, so I just want to mention my family, and I uh, have a very, very, very close family. Uh, but the school years, I was very quiet, but I had my little small group of friends, and it was a lot of fun. We had just, just so much fun in school, and and, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, 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 how much time I got? Okay, I've got time for this. I was really traumatized in the first grade. I was crawling up, me and a bunch of boys the wrong end. We had a real, real, real tall slide. And I got knocked off of it and I broke my leg. Okay, so sometime, this was in the spring of 1954. So I'm in the classroom with a, with a broken leg, and all of a sudden these alarms start going off. And it was a fire alarm. And none of us knew anything about a fire alarm. And I was in Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Brassel's class. I was in Mrs. Barrister's class, and all the kids from fourth grade through third grade, they're filing out there and lined up out on the school ground. And our class starts filing out, and I grab my crutches and everything, and Mrs. Barrister said, oh, Danny, you go, okay, you don't have to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I thought she liked me. <laughs> and I thought, well, she's just going to let me burn up in here. You know, so that, <laughs> that was kind of an eye opener there, but, but uh, uh, anyway, that's just one of the many stories, and uh, 
and then I named the second grade Miss Bonham uh, that was raining, so then some guys were out back in the back playing with the clay, and, I, and the bell rang, and she wasn't in the class. I knew I needed to sit down, but I didn't. Peer pressure took over, and she sat us down. She sat, four or five of us, she sat us out in the hall. That's it. Anyway, we're looking down the hall for Miss Bessie. <laughs> Uh, my education started out, uh, much like then, with Miss Mary Lee Bryson and Mary Hudson at their kindergarten. They had a little, uh, uh, I guess it was Miss Hudson's house, had a kindergarten uh, class. There about 35 kids in our uh, first class. Uh, Daryl Grubbs, Leanne Looney, Jennifer Dempsey, Jamie Duffer, a lot of the, uh, the same kids that I went to high school. I got to play, uh, got to play David in the Christmas play with Deborah Cloud. So that was, uh, that was a pretty neat deal. And uh, got to first grade, and uh, uh, Miss Sue Reed was my first grade teacher. I don't know, uh, Georgiana uh, Grayston, uh, her mom uh, was daughter of Sue Reed. But anyway, notice that a lot of these kids that were in Miss Hudson's kindergarten, they were in my same first grade class. And then we went to second grade with Miss Edna Craig. And sure enough, all these kids were, were in my class as well. I'm like, man, this is going to be pretty cool. I'm going to get to go through school with all the same kids, not ever having to make any new friends. And then Miss Bessie Graham retired in 1976. And when she retired, I noticed I didn't get to be in class with those kids anymore. Uh, I guess it's nice when you can set that in class and put those kids together, but uh, the pr this, uh, principal that came after her did not see the need to put me in the class with all those other kids. But anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time at Crestview, and then we went over to Oakview, and it was a dilapidated building back when I was going there. And man, <laughs> I don't know how in the world they let us go to school in that in that building, Jeff. I thought it was just going to fall in on us any day. Uh, but anyway, we had a lot of great memories there. And then we went to high school, and we were the second uh, group to graduate in the new building. Uh, and when they built that, uh, a lot of great times, um, you know, there at New Boston. But uh, there was some, Mr. Wilmerdine was talking about the band, and I was in the band too, and had the good fortune of having uh, Robin Watson as uh, my band director from the sixth grade to the, I believe it's the uh, tenth grade, and then James Kaufman took over. And, uh, and I was kind of tossing and turning about whether to play sports. I, like then, I was kind of small. I wasn't a very big kid uh, growing up, and uh, I got hurt in the eighth grade when my back got knocked out of whack. And my dad said, son, I don't think football's for you. You probably need to just stay in the band. Uh, so I got in the band, and there were 120 kids in the band and eight boys. <laughs> what a time. Uh, but anyway, uh, boys back then, you know, they weren't, they weren't supposed to be in the band, but, uh, but I, it, uh, it helped me because uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but I would later go on A&M and become a member of the Fighting Texas Aggie Band, and that afforded me lots of opportunities went to uh, three Cotton Bowls, uh, January 1st of 1986, 86, 87, and 88. I was sitting in the Cotton Bowl uh, watching uh, Bo Jackson get beat by the Fighting Texas Aggies, 36 to 16. Uh, the next year we got uh, our tails handed to us by uh, Ohio State, 41 to 24. And then the next year we beat Notre Dame and Tim Brown, uh, 42 to 10. So I've got some pretty good memories, and when I was a senior, we got to march in the uh, inaugural parade, uh, presidential inaugural parade of the first George Bush. Uh, so it, it afforded me lots of opportunities after high school to, uh, uh, to play in the band and do something, do something pretty neat like that. And back when I was in the band at A&M, there was only one girl and 302 boys. <laughs> the <laughs> ratio was kind of reversed. Uh, as far as church goes, uh, man, there's a lot of things. Uh, I, I don't, there's a lot of things that happen that I don't know why they happen. Uh, but y'all know where Red Bayou Methodist Church is. My descendants gave that land to build that church and to have that cemetery out there. And I don't know why I go to Tap Methodist Church. It's because my grandmother and my mom and dad did. But that's where I went uh, growing up. And I was the one that, I was the acolyte the Sunday that they carried the, from the old building down here, downtown, I was the acolyte the day we carried the flame from the old church to the new church. That's my claim to fame, I guess. 
uh, from that. Um, but no reason. We still attend Tap Methodist Church in New Boston. My wife and I have attended the Catholic Church here in New Boston from time to time because her mother's Catholic. Um, I've been to Daniel's Chapel to preach. I've been to uh, Red Bayou to preach, and I've preached at Tap as well. And I've also attended the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. Uh, with one of my good friends, uh, Steve Gilman, because he asked me to go. I've been to First Baptist. I've been to uh, Temple Baptist. I've been to a lot of churches, but uh, Tap United Methodist Church has been the primary influence. All right, well, the next one is shenanigans, near-death experiences, and things you never told your parents. <laughs> But I, I forgot to say something that back on one of these, uh, may I back up just a speck? Of course. During those years of, uh, I didn't have sports and all, but I did enjoy riding the horses and all. Back in that time, uh, for some reason, Mr. McCord invited Elvis Presley to our high school, and uh, we couldn't fill that gym. I mean, it's just empty seats everywhere. But as I sat in my chair pretty far back, Mr. McCord was a little farther back, and I kept looking back thinking, are you sure you really wanted to bring that man here? Because he was really cutting up on stage. And I can remember a story also I don't know if it's the first time he was here in 56, I think, and then the next one was 57. I don't remember 57 too well, but it was out on the uh, football field, and he had a pink Cadillac and all that. But uh, one of the girls in our class won a trip down to either Wilson's or Trevor's, and while down there, she was with him buying whatever. I guess I don't know if she was there that time or not, but one time he was down there at eating, and Glenna was just a little girl, and Elvis picked her up and put her up on the table in his booth, and they sort of snuggled his <laughs> as best I understand. Is that true? <laughs> That's true. Well, I'll go to my shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any times I was really cutting up too much, but um, the near deaths, I'll, I can go to that better, because I'm a cat of nine lives at least. Well, I already told you one, I, I'm not supposed to be here. I fell in that tub of water that was being drained from an old-timey washing machine. And the only thing about that was I've had uh, bronchial pneumonia almost every year after that. Um, and in that house, though, I do want to say this. The couple sitting on the second row back there, Mike and Annette Haran, now live in the home I was born in, in the front bedroom. And they have it. It looks like something out of Better Homes and Gardens. They have just kept it going. After Mom and Dad died, my brother and I could not have done that. So I'm so proud of you. Well, uh, besides that toddler accident, uh, I was swimming uh, in Little River and had a, well, actually crossing Little River with a bunch of kids. And we, I had an a inner tube holding onto it tightly and stepped into a whirlpool mm -hmm. as I stepped off the bank. And it pulled me under so quickly, the older guys behind me saw the, didn't see me, but saw the inner tube pop up real high and knew that it had done that, I guess forcefully caused it to go up. And he somehow got me out just a little further down. So that, I was 10 years old, I think, at that time. Uh, like I said, I love to uh, ride uh, horses and one time leaving a parade. The parade was advertising Bowie County Fair in the parade, uh, Wiggs Foster and I decided we'd trade horses. 
Well, his horse had a bridle rein that was tied with the, uh, when it's wet and it stays tight, well, it came loose, it wasn't bratted. And when that bridle rein came loose on that horse, he took off and I couldn't pull back with one rein. I'd flip him into the cars that we were meeting coming and going. That horse stayed in the middle of that road all the way down uh, Elm Street to uh, where the Burlesons lived. I don't know if y'all know where that is. It's down past the ball field. And there was, they had built a new fence. It was real tight and tall and it looked like a railroad ties for the post. And as that horse was just about to head into that, he turned and got in the ditch to head into that fence, Sid Garden and David Harris got me off. I don't know how, I don't know what happened to the horse. All I know is they, they got me off the horse. <laughs> I, I was really lucky because that horse could have run into any of those cars. But anyway, uh, uh, Sid probably out of ran. I I was going to take me out of train wreck, but I don't want to hear that. I got it so bad. You got to tell the one you gave away from me. I'll give her some of my time. <laughs> okay. No, no. <laughs> because my mom and dad needed me to. The hired hand that we had, Ed, uh, never learned to drive. And uh, mom said that she was sick with a headache and she wanted some BC head uh, powders or something. And I had gone to town to try on a major red outfit for Christmas parade. And as I was going back over the railroad track to turn and go down to Miss to Ed Eubank's mother's house to try on this. You were 15. I looked. You were 15. Uh -huh. I was in the, I was sophomore. And I looked this way and no train, look, you know. But the car here that came up is a little bit of an incline and it was not as clean as it is now either. And it was frosty night, December. I could see out, but not good. And, uh, I thought, are they going to let me go in front of them to turn left? They'd come up, then they'd roll back. I think, no, maybe I will get to go behind them. Those few minutes of trying to decide, that train was on me. And blowing its whistle and, and its lights, you could see the lights and all. And it, I stepped on the gas real hard and it hit the back door instead of the front door. We had no seat belts. I went through the front windshield. Well, about that big of a hole, it was enough for my head to go partly through, and it cut me from here clear around to here. And uh, I can remember getting uh, being down in the floorboard. I never was passed out, but I had on white aggy coveralls. <laughs> And I did not want those coveralls ruined, but they were absolutely covered with blood when they uh, got me to the hospital. And uh, Dr. McGee sewed me up. It took two hours of sewing up. He took real a lot of time, made me frown and smile. And my boyfriend, Tommy, was allowed to go in there and watch. Well, he would end up with the nurse uh, out on the steps to get sick. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I, I praise the Lord, I, I got over it and it's not so bad. <laughs> Dr. McGee said, let me look at you, my masterpiece, because he did take a long time of sewing me up all the way around here. So that's my near death. <laughs> There's some others on the And I remember that. I remember very well hearing about that. Uh, I, don't, I didn't have any, before I went overseas, any near-death experiences. I guess the closest I had to a near-death experience is when I got into trouble with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a, he was a wonderful man, a lot of fun to be around, but when dad said John, he said, hi, hi, sir. And uh, as far as shenanigans, 
I can't say shenanigans without involving my old neighbor Melvin Stewart. <laughs> and he and I just, I don't know why, we just, uh, something happened when he and I got together, you know, just something crazy was going to happen. And, you know, we didn't do anything that we were going to, the law was going to get out there or something. We just did silly things. And one thing we did, I told somebody earlier today, is uh, we lived right south of the New Boston Cemetery. Is that what I'm already? <laughs> I, uh, we lived just south of the cemetery, so we weren't afraid of cemeteries. You know, we spent half our life up there, it seemed like. So, Melvin and I were there for one summer night, and uh, we saw this car coming up the road. It was, I say, night. It was getting dusky dark. So, we saw this car coming up the road, so we called out of the Wilbur Barthel's pasture in the old tall sage grass and laid down, and it was a boy and a girl, summertime, windows were down, and they're going up there to park. <laughs> so we let them get good and comfortable and this and that, and we started. Uh, <laughs> and this went on for a while. But when the car, when the car left, I promise you, he was spinning gravel. He was slinging gravel. So somebody is still telling that story today about the paints and the new bumps. <laughs> near-death experiences. I was in uh, Vietnam with the 1st Air Cavalry Division for, for 14 months, and uh, thankfully the, uh, the Lord got me through that. Uh, a lot of uh, really close calls uh, were a major uh, combat outfit, and we were under attack a lot. And uh, so uh, I just know I'm going to give the Lord all the glory for allowed me to get out of there without, actually without a, without a scratch. I was not hit with a scratch or a bullet or anything, just wounded from the neck up. But uh, the Lord put a wonderful lady in my life to help uh, solve me. Now, as far as, far as uh, that's the main thing I can think of as far as, uh, the funniest thing, I guess, was the, the scaring the people in the, in the cemetery. Well, one time we took, uh, Mr. Stone, they, they, they let my dad and Mr. Stone, my neighbor, farm the south end of the cemetery for a few years. And uh, Mr. Stone you know, would plow. We had a, we had a tractor because it was my job every year in the springtime. When I got big enough, we had to walk behind David Bradley's tractor. It was, my, it was my job to flat break the disc, get the gardens ready for seeding and, and cultivating. And Mr. Stone plowed with a mule. But anyway, he had a scarecrow in the pasture, and Mel and I got it, and we made us a hanging noose, and there was an, oak, an old big oak tree up on the cemetery road, and, and we uh, got it up there, and we, and, uh, and we actually hung the scarecrow. I mean, the scarecrow. <laughs> I guess that's kind of awful, taking Mr. Young, Mr. Stone's uh, scarecrow. But we, we had some kids talking about that, didn't we, Melvin? Yeah, we stuck a butcher knife in it too. No. <laughs> I forgot about that. But anyway, just just fun stuff, getting getting the humor stuff, and and we uh, oh gosh, we lived by the woods. You know, the, the the woods were a lot closer back then. You know, we spent it seemed like half a life in those woods, and then across from us, uh, the pasture was the the woods, the the map rocks with all the peacocks and. Uh, Oh gosh, he had, I think, 20-something roosters, and the roosters, you know, we'd hear them crowing in the morning early, and the peacocks in the evening, and, uh, and, uh, and Mr. and Mrs. Minecraft, they were some very, very, very interesting people to go. Well, you went to their farm, it was like going back in time 50 years. They were just wonderful, wonderful people, and, and uh, but I can't, uh, I, I, I can't think of another Shenanigan, because I didn't act up in school back then. Because uh, I was, oh, okay. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. A parrot that could sing the old Red Cross, that is true. Okay. Um, there were a couple of them that my, uh, my mom and dad did not want any of us 
owning a motorcycle, riding a motorcycle, or even getting on one when we were kids. So what do you do when your parents say you can't do this? There's only one thing to do, right, Don? Get on it. There was a kid that I hung out in high school. His name was Lavelle Williams, Jr. We called him JR. Uh, he lived over here off uh, Daniels Chapel Road with a young man named Jess Lynch. Uh, JR had a few problems at home, and, uh, and uh, he went to live with Jess when he was a sophomore. Well, he worked for DM Supply, so we had a little bit of spending money, and he, uh, he got him a Honda Nighthawk S, which is a 1984 model, red and black. And I'd ride with him on a Friday night, and we'd make a loop in the Triple T Food Mart parking lot and go around Pizza Hut, you know, looking for all our friends and everything. And he decided that little Nighthawk 550 wasn't big enough. So he bought him a Honda Hurricane 1100, what they call a crotch rocket. And I decided that I would get on that thing with him. Now, we never rode with a helmet. We didn't want our <coughs> hair getting messed up. But anyway, we never rode with a helmet. And we were out on Highway 98 doing about 140 miles an hour, tears streaming down the side of my face. I said, JR, if you will slow this thing down to 100, I'll get off. <laughs> Don't know how in the world we lived through those things, but, you know, we did. And the two other stories that I have go down to my, I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Lake Dallas, Texas on a farm. And uh, they had three kids, Kurt Lane and Allison. Kurt was my age. Lane was Todd's age. And Allison was Terry's age. Allison did not normally participate in our escapades, but we made the best with what we what we had, and the thing that I really liked going about seeing Uncle Ronnie and Aunt Sandra, they had two motorcycles, and we would ride those things all over that pasture. But one afternoon, I was on the on the motorcycle, a little late in the afternoon, everybody else had already gone in, and I was going down a draw, and I was coming up, and I made a mistake. I was falling off the motorcycle, so I did what any good man would do. I gave it a little more juice. And that son of a gun went through a five-strand barbed wire fence. And I've still got scars on my hands where I went through. But I picked that motorcycle up, repaired that fence the best I could, and headed back home. Because I didn't want Uncle Ronnie to tell us that we couldn't ride that thing anymore. <laughs> and the uh, near-death experience that I had was uh, we had had a uh, culvert, about a 24-inch culvert, and a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood, and we put it in the bottom of a ditch. And we would ride that bicycle as fast as we could down that ditch and jump it and go to the other side. Well, I don't know if y'all know the difference between a boy's bike and a girl's bike, but we were riding a boy's bike that day. And I scurried down that hill and I hit that ramp hard and I came off that banana seat and I missed it on the way back down. And I hurt and I opened up my pants and there was enough blood in there to supply a blood bank for probably a couple of six months. So I had to run back home, tell my aunt to go to the hospital in Denton and they stitched me up. I had two on the inside and seven on the outside. And uh, fortunately they dissolved. They didn't have to go back in there and fix anything else. Uh, but that was my near death experience and I thought I was gonna bleed out in the back of that LTD on the way to Denton Hospital. But the last little story, one minute, the last little story I will tell you is I've always been an entrepreneur. And I hope this is not to condone this sort of activity, this is just telling you, just put it out there. When I was a senior and we uh, had junior senior prom, I didn't have a date, so I thought of other things to do. So I went down to Tom's Jug House in Texarkana, Arkansas, purchased about six kegs for $175, and threw the best junior senior prom party that has ever been thrown in Tyson Bottom on some land that my dad was leasing. There's probably about four or five hundred kids out there and we charged three dollars a head for coming in the gate. That is when I fell in love with capitalism. <laughs> Boston, and I loved history, and I 
hope y'all will read some of the history. It's so interesting. I've enjoyed school so very much uh, from first grade all the way through. But when I got in high school, there was a teacher named Miss Perky. <laughs> she prepared us for college better than any teacher I had ever had. I didn't have her just freshman, sophomore. His early boss had been junior, senior. She retired just when we were going to become juniors. Therefore, we got to have Miss, Miss Perky moved up to teach junior, senior. So I had her freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. We were the only class that got to have for four years, but that was absolutely wonderful. And if you started out to go to junior college down in Texarkana, they would see Miss, they'd say, uh, did you happen to have Miss Perky as your teacher? They'd say, well, you'll sail through English here. They, they really, she really prepared us. But I'll have to also say my parents prepared me for my mom had taught school at Highway, a little school up close to where uh, Skaggs is. And uh, my grandfather also prepared me for life. His name was Walter McGee. He was the brother of Dr. J.R. McGee, Ellis McGee's daddy. Uh, he, he was my grandfather. Walter McGee was a fine man. He built, built the house on um, McGee Street and Ellis Street, where the, the uh, Geeko tree is. And that's the largest one in the state of Texas. Miss Willie Morris lived there later on. And I was looking at that tree. It's not looking as good as I was hoping it would. It's not looking too good. <laughs> but that was the largest tree. But, uh, Walter McGee, we called Papa. Also prepared my brother for the ministry. That man was a sweet Christian man, just like my daddy. Now my daddy would read the Bible at the table every day, and then he'd put a pencil down and close it. He'd mark right where he stopped, and it didn't go to work, which was just down the hill. What was beautiful was he'd always go over to mom and she'd be standing to wash dishes. He'd go up behind her, love on her, kiss on her neck. And it was so sweet. He said, I gotta go to work. And she'd say, I'll be helping you after a while. <laughs> and I got to see those things. So uh, I think my parents really, really showed love. And uh, what was funny was uh, our hired hand, Ed, would be sitting there uh, as Dad read the paper and whatever, I mean, the Bible, and as he got through reading, Ed would say, Dad, gum, my coffee got cold. And Dad, <laughs> Dad would say, now, Ed, we can heat that coffee up, but it's not every time you can hear the Bible. So um, they talk good things to all of us kids. As far as you've uh, also preparing me for my life, you know, a lot of things, and maybe most of the things, I really didn't realize until many years later, looking back and what some of these role models did for me. First of all, my mother did very, very hard workers. I said they grew up in poor Red River County farming families. Both of them had a sixth grade education. So back then, if when you were old enough to plug your weight on the farm, that was it for education. But mom, you look back, and she would correct our English. I didn't think about that here later. I'd say, well, that ain't right. She said, that isn't right. That's what I said. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, and then dad was uh, uh, very, very hard working. Well, my mother and dad both. But dad, uh, well, like I said, we grew most everything we ate. Uh, Dad in the 40s got a job at Red River Arsenal and he worked there until his knees finally gave out in 1970. But then when he came home, 
he worked the gardens. He uh, he was a very very talented man. He would, he could fix anything on a car. He could he could do carpentry work, electrical work, you name it. He was just a smart individual to do most of everything, and then really kind of set a pass path for us as uh, an example of hard work. Also, I want to mention uh, Mr. D. H. Cox, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I worked for Mr. Cox for several years, haul groceries, haul head, cow feed and chicken feed back in the back, and then later on I was uh, put in the uh, meat market to work for, for Ralph Higgs. And I just loved working at Cox's. It was just neat as heck. And we were right next door to Parker and Howell and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Mr. Cox. Most of the people came in his store. He knew them by name. On Saturday, when they had, you know, downtown New Boston was busy as heck on Saturday back in those days. And uh, Mr. Cox would have on his slacks, so a white shirt and a tie, and he would greet everyone at the door. He had a bunch of people checking out then. <clears throat> but, um, like I said, he, uh, he treated everyone I, I, I just in such a magnificent manner, and, and like I said, it's things I didn't really notice until later on in life, and, and then I learned how to treat uh, folks. Uh, also, I got really interested in history. Uh, I said my family were uh, they were pioneers in Red River County, and uh, I've done a, a, a lot of work on those and. Uh, was one of the loves in my life is, uh, and, and, and still is, is, is history. Uh, Mr. Jim Stone, uh, our neighbor Mr. Stone, also was one of my role models. And one thing I was going to tell about him earlier, uh, that uh, we'd go coon hunting together, and this man could walk, walk, walk. He'd carry the lantern up front, and I'd carry the shotgun and the axe in the back, Hit the branches in my face from where he was walking, and and we would go out in the winter time, and we would go out on a cloudless night because we could tell our direction by Orion. The constellation Orion was in the east, so that way we knew which direction we were going. And one night we walked for miles and miles, came out on this dirt road, and Mr. Cox, I mean Mr. Stone, and that deep voice said, "We're in the end, we won't go back." Through all them briars and things, we'll just take the road back to the pickup. And I said, Well, how far do you think it is, Mr. Stone? Oh, not very far, about three or four miles. <laughs> I, was, I was ready to lay down in the ditch and go to sleep. But anyway, uh, he re re remains one of the role models in my life, as well as, as, well as my parents. I'm going to say probably the, the thing that most prepared me for life was the ability to work with my dad growing up uh, from 10 years old on. Uh, you learn to work at it. Uh, we picked up cigarettes and Triple T uh, parking lot. We fixed air conditioners. We swept. We swept front lawns. We, uh, we mowed yards. We did everything with apartments that you can imagine. Uh, you know, cleaned up apartments, fixed plumbing problems, electrical problems. So it, it taught me a work ethic like that. And uh, when I was a senior, Fred Smith came around and said, hey, Tim, would you like to go to work for the Texas Highway Department this summer? Sure, coach, I think I'd like to do that. He said it pays $5.40 an hour. You work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Coach, I'm in. That's about three times what I was making at Graham's Appliance. What he didn't tell me is I'd be working at a rest area. <laughs> I was a rest area attendant out on I-30 going toward Dallas on the uh, north side of the road. And uh, you really, uh, you learn a lot working as a rest area attendant, especially when the bathrooms are closed. Uh, but anyway, we uh, picked up trash, we uh, mowed yards, kept the picnic areas clean, uh, emptied a lot of sanitary boxes uh, with diapers and other things in them. Uh, but you kind of learn a little bit of humility in doing things like that. And you learn that no job is beneath you. Uh, and that's really what my dad was trying to teach me, that Tim, you may have to do some things that you don't like to do during your life, but gut it up and do it. The next thing I learned was probably uh, you better surround yourself with some pretty good people.
that will give you good advice, that won't lead you down into a path of trouble, and that will continually uh, give you good advice and keep you out of trouble. And I referenced that earlier in my, my talk when I introduced myself, that I really got some people like that fortunate enough in, in high school and in college to surround uh, myself with people like that and I just uh, stay away. And the third thing is probably uh, probably my, my religion and my faith. Uh, I've got one little story to tell you that, you know, if you know me and my family, you know we're always late. Uh, my mother uh, was late. I mean, she'll be late to her own funeral, uh, and I inherited that. But there was one night that we were coming downtown to, got one minute, Pat? Okay. We were coming downtown for Christmas Eve service at Tap Methodist Church, and we had all the boys loaded up, and, and we pulled in the parking lot at 7, and everybody's leaving. My mom had got the time wrong. Six o'clock instead of seven. So my dad kept driving that 1983 Lincoln Continental with those three boys in the back. My mama crying in the front seat, and we went home. And when we got home and walked through the door, my dad went over to the, the table and got his old Bible that he did his Sunday school lessons with, and we opened up that Bible on the living room floor, and we sat there and he retold the story of Jesus' birth. And that right there was the one thing that uh, my dad did me. I, you say, well, Tim, that's pretty stupid. Why would you remember something like that? Because my mom was crying. She was embarrassed that they had missed that. And he said, well, we may have missed it as uh, corporately, but there's no reason we can't celebrate as family, which goes back to Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I thank God every day that I was raised in a small community where Glenda Howe, uh, you know, Camille McCool's mom could tell on me, Peggy Deer could tell on me, Paul Prang's dad, Tommy and Prang could tell on me. Uh, got one last story to tell, I'm going to tell it on my brother, my youngest one, Terry. Uh, he, uh, we went to church one day and uh, uh, Tommy Prang approached my dad at Sunday school and said, Jimmy, you might want to go over to the police station this morning. Dad didn't ask any questions, just went over there to the police station and he said, my name's uh, Jim Graham. Did you, uh, did you have an incident involving one of my sons last night? Well, yeah, yeah, we did. So we found out what the charges are and they went home from church and uh, my mom and my dad are sitting there in the living room when Terry walks through the door and they said, Terry, is there something you want to tell us? He said, well, not really, but I guess I'll go ahead. And that is one thing about growing up in New Boston. You can't get away with anything. <laughs> Absolutely nothing can you get away with. And I think that prepared me a lot for life in the real world.
where it has all that beautiful glass windows as you enter. Mr. He sold beautiful suits to the men folks in town. He had the Strand Theater, and that's where they had their uh, ceremonies, like sometimes graduation and different things. Um, I have one article back there, 1936, at the Strand. Uh, they were having uh, a dance recital. And my mother-in-law's name's on that. She's just a little girl. History's wonderful. I just love it. But the wonderful history about Boston, we in New Boston are certainly, I think, very uh, lucky people to be able to say we had three Bostons. But not only that, our county seat has been in five places. It started out in the cab for a few months from, well, it's four or five months. And it then went out to what's old Boston. They had a log cabin. Then they had a, a lumber one, a saw or whatever they call that, hewn log of boards, a frame one. But they were small. They wanted a larger one. They built a brick one. The brick one was made out of bricks that were actually uh, handmade on site by an on site kiln. And they, the flooring was designed beautifully. They had uh, diagonal layers of squares for the floor. They said it was beautiful, it was two story. Uh, somehow, other it burned and thinks the Canadian had it. They had it for about four, three to four years. And 300 West Main Street, Texacana, in an old opera house, which really needed repair, and the county clerk had complained that this place needs to be fixed up better and safer, and it burned. Well, that was the time they decided maybe New Boston was going to get it because everything had deteriorated as far as people were moving to New Boston and there were no more, uh, well, since the train came through, all of the businesses in Old Boston needed to come closer to the rail and they started plank by plank tearing down their businesses. And there were so many there. There were lawyers' offices and doctors' offices, saloons, schools, they had, it was a very, it was noted for its education, and it had three colleges or schools or seminaries that we know of, and that was the Milam Masonic School, and then there was uh, the Featherstones, and then there was the uh, one called Ringwood Seminary, Seminary, I think. I couldn't find much information on that, but it was one by a lady who, uh, I found more information on her than I did on the school and where it was. But I think Mark Mahone has some information on where that school was. But just think, they had all the schools and everything, but they didn't, the railroad didn't go through there. But uh, when they did the, center of geographic center it ended up over there in boston and that's where i love that's where i was born up on the hill <laughs> and then of course uh, that for some reason uh, it was a newer modern one was built in eight, uh, 1985 that one burns in 1987 and that's what we have today but that was such a beautiful courthouse. I know I've talked too long, but I just wanted to give y'all a little bit of that history. Can I just, just one quick? Uh, <clears throat> New Boston, for a very, very small town, has produced a, a ton of successful 
people in education, medicine, mm -hmm. business, especially not to slide any other years, but especially the 1950s and 1960s. The class of 58, Bobby Ferguson, a high executive in TD Industries. Uh, same class, Bobby Prime, Lewis Hills Prime, and Lumber Company, right down the street from where I work. We, uh, uh, Millage Hart, who was a huge, in his life, huge contributors to SMU, which of course, uh, Gerald Turner, class of 64, uh, Gerald Turner is the president. I think we had three people in New Boston that were, I know really high up in, I don't know their positions, I know Ed Higginbotham at Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas, Ed Roach at, uh, I think it's called West Texas State back then, and then that, uh, no, uh, Troy in Alabama. Uh, doctors, uh, Wilson Garrett, were very, very well known. Uh, uh, vascular, thank you, vascular surgeon in Dallas. Also, uh, Dennis Striplin, hand surgeon. My, both my sisters worked in McCoy's drugstore in my KG today. She worked with Dennis, and if he broke a glass, and uh, and the sink, he wouldn't clean it up because he was afraid he had to harm his hands and he already knew in high school what he was gonna do. And I was like a goose in a hellstorm in high school. <laughs> but then we had uh, Robert Baum, who was a dentist, and if I'm leaving out anyone, but, but uh, uh, Bobby Ferguson, who is a wonderful, wonderful man, and I'm, I know I'm leaving out some people in this, but. The, the, he said that the people would ask, what's in the water in New Boston? <laughs> even, I think Gerald told me even the principal at Highland Park High School in the Ritzy part of Dallas had heard about that. What's in the water in New Boston High School? And, uh, and it, you, you just, uh, and uh, I got with, uh, I had this idea I got with Mr. Don Alexander, who was the publisher of the Boot County Citizens Tribune, and I wrote several articles. Uh, Isabel, Pierce, Isabel Sim, there's a school named for her in Frisco, Sim Elementary. You just go on and on and on. And uh, uh, a real, real funny, I'll post this up real quickly. Uh, when that journal was the first story I did, and he told me all the rest of the stories, he sent me a copy of the paper to me, and then I told him that uh, got down the line that I was going to do a, a story on Bob Ferguson. Well, he and Bob are real good friends. They also like to give each other a lot of grief. So he told me, he said, when you see Bob, tell him, I said, you can't believe a word he said. So uh, Bob would send Gerald a note from the mail and said, the only reason you got to play football is because your dad was a principal. And he had misspelled principal. And Gerald would ring it up and give him a grade and send it back to him. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I just want to bring out all the, the huge amount of successful people in the education, medicine, and business that came out of this community and it's from our education system. And that's, 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 was a Dan, monumental thing. What was that motivational speaker that you went to school with? Yeah, Oh, Mark Johnson. Yeah. I was in my senior class, and Mark wound up with, with his doctorate, and he wrote some books. He wrote a book that was, uh, I, did, yeah, I did a story for Mark. He was living in Idleville at that time, and uh, I went up and interviewed him, spent the night with him, and uh, of course we go way back to first grade together. And uh, he actually wrote a book that then the category it was in was like the book of the year in, in Oklahoma. And of course, I was about as tired the long reason it's a book of the year in, in Oklahoma is the only one that was written. And, <laughs> and anyway, uh, I, right off the top of my head, I can't think of anyone else, but, uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. Frank Looney, yeah. Frank and, and Tommy. Tommy was a dentist, and Frank was a. Uh, Air Nose Throat. Throat. And also uh, James Holt, known as Red Holt. And, and Kay, what was Red? Did you know what Red did? I Red, but I can't say. But he was very successful. It just, it's just, it's. 
it was just uh, phenomenal, phenomenal method. The amount of uh, successful kids that came out of this community, and it's, it says a lot about the community of New Boston. I am like Tim and Wilma Dean. I'm so proud to be from here. So you mentioned the the elementary school that you went to. Mm -hmm. It's still here, isn't it? No. That house is gone? Yeah, the, the Crestview, we, we renamed the elementary school Oakview and all the one that was torn down. Okay, let me, always been Crestview. let me rephrase that. You yes, said sir. kindergarten. Yes. You went to a house in kindergarten. Yes. That's still yes, here. It is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The yes, house is still here. The school oh. is not here. They got right. rid of Oakview back when they got rid of Red River Court. Johnny Alford was the last principal, I think, at, at Oakview, and the courts were already torn down by then. I want to ask something, Wilma. Well, what about the Waukea Theater? You talk about yes. theater. Uh, it was there when I was in high school. They built it. It had later. a walk in thing there. Then it kind of a B you went in. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, Harris. Yeah. Mickey yeah. and Penny. Yeah. 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 Where Plum Fun Furniture was. It became Plum Fun. And then later it became a forest. I don't know what else it's been. And Daniel would take us to the movies, and he had no idea how old any of us were. Because it was different price for different age kids, and he'd turn around, all right, how old are y'all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I paid nine cents to get in. I think it was Strand. For